Hello traders, it's Friday, August the 11th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you the market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of excitement, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in a very tenuous and uh, exciting uh, final 24 hours of this trading week. Well, we start off with this chart. This is the VIX Volatility Index, a frequent uh, chart for us uh, over the past weeks, months, and years. And what has been very remarkable consistently for this index is that it has been very, very deflated. We've been oscillating around 10, which historically is an extremely low level on many different uh, measures. This was actually the quietest period on record for this uh, index that goes back quite a few years, quite a couple, dec uh, a few decades. Um, so it's that context of which we see this dramatic climb. Now, this isn't a one-day affair. It's actually risen uh, three days through Thursday. Uh, but it is obviously Thursday's session alone that really brings the drama. Uh, we have a, a move that pushes this volatility measure, this activity often considered a fear measure, up to a level that we haven't seen uh, since way back here on November the 8th. And we know what happened on November 8th, 9th. That was the U.S. presidential election anticipation really soaring. And uh, really, the only comparison we have is uh, the aftermath. But this is a very exceptional level of volatility. Now, I'm not one to put technical analysis on measures uh, rather than price. This is a barometer. Uh, and... Indicators like this are really uh, useful when we're reflecting upon the conditions which they reflect. In its traditional sense, the volatility index from the CBOE is a reflection of pure implied volatility, anticipated activity from the S&P 500, which is its benchmark, uh, over the one-month time frame. But we have to be practical and realistic nowadays. This is a tradable instrument. It has, has been uh, clear in futures, which uh, uh, has been one of the highlights of great concern uh, that I've been pointing out recently, that futures traders are net short a record uh, amount of contracts on the volatility f index. So net short, record net short. Let me... Just reinforce that because we were already at 10, which was a historically low level, and they were not just modestly short, short on net, but they were they were short in massive numbers. So now we have a massive 60% loss for those that were short around 10. It just this this really points to the risk reward factors that we have to think about when you go let's say, long risk on, and you're already in an expensive market where uh, benchmarks like the S&P 500 are already extraordinarily expensive uh, and have struggled with trend, you're talking about a lower potential, a smaller gain uh, by being long and sticking with that risk trend. But you're also talking about a much more fantastical threat, a risk, because the Potential for returns are smaller, but the threat should a risk aversion kick in, even if it's a lower probability, uh, the move would be far more substantial. So the imbalance of risk reward is really prominent and present when we talk about the S&P 500, a, a constant uh, discussion point for us. But when it comes to something like the VIX volatility index, the contrast to the S&P 500 is you actually have upside potential. While it might be restrained in its advance, it can still move higher. There is no cap on a record high. But there is a cap, a natural and a practical cap for volatility. And at 10, this really does show us how extreme the impracticalities of market positioning are. I, I point this out because it really emphasizes the conditions. All right, we'll talk about what is motivating this turn of fear uh, in the markets, uh, and I think most of us already know, but I want to emphasize it's not the catalyst. Just like it wasn't the catalyst back during the great financial crisis, uh, it wasn't subprime housing that was really the broad issue that led to the full-scale uh, collapse of the markets. It was the circumstances that uh, had supported the lead-up to that particular catalyst. 
an, an excessive use of leverage, a deep complacency in markets, a abundance of uh, financial wizardry that wasn't based upon practical value. It sounds very familiar to what we are today. But it's conditions. It is conditions that lead to uh, deep reversals in markets, all right, a full-scale risk correction, but it is also really the genesis of full-blown crises. So we have to keep that in mind when we are making our investments. Sure, markets may remain steady and you slowly climb higher and higher and higher, uh, practically uh, bowling over uh, what it seems to be reasonable assessments of value, but if you go for those kind of trades, be mindful of what the risk reward imbalance is and what the risks in particular really represent. All right, the VIX volatility index is truly a strong reflection of this. But looking at the VIX volatility index, we actually had, if you want to play it this way, because I, I think it is a speculative asset, a technical break on a multi-year uh, wedge. All right, so we're breaking to the upside. Is this sustainable? Well, it, it's the nature of the volatility index that it doesn't really live through these high degree volatility measures for very long. It has a tendency to revert to a norm, to go to a regular uh, degree of activity. But if you see here, I actually have the moving average in green. We're at an extremely low level, even lower than what we had back in the summer of 2014, which for those that were trading in that period was the most frustrating time ever. Uh, and we are likely to see that it can come out with a higher resting rate of volatility, meaning greater activity, greater uncertainty and concern in the market. And that can lead to, if, per, if it persists, a eventual turn of these over leveraged markets. Again, conditions matter more than the just catalyst that we come across and uh, really crowds the headlines. All right. Now, what was the motivation? What is the catalyst here? Actually, I think it's a culmination of a few things. We've had the turn to monetary policy, which has to this point been generally uh, taken into consideration, but not necessarily the motivator for people to massively delever. Uh, you have to recall that the risk that this exposure represents, markets are heavily long uh, speculative assets because of, in part, the support offered by central banks, which helps to reduce volatility, at least history suggests that. But as it starts to turn and this market starts to speculate on uh, the ECB backing on QE and uh, central banks like the Bank of England and the uh, Bank of Canada and the RBA, uh, the speculation surrounding them uh, potentially tightening, this starts to genuinely shift the big picture perspective of complacent stable markets in which I can really reach for that risk exposure. All right, so we have this uh, broad shift uh, in monetary policy, which is one of the considerations. We also have a moderation of economic activity. So the growth forecasts continuously uh, find themselves downgraded from the US to the rest of the world. Uh, we've had protectionism go on and off. Uh, but really, I think that the uh, what we're, we're finding to be the, the capable catalyst is the risk of a, a, a war. Um, now, wars are not uh, particularly rare uh, through human history or even modern history, uh, but their impact on the markets uh, really uh, is inconsistent because you don't have a lot of data points. I right? don't like to boil it down to these circumstances from a purely economic pers and trading perspective, but that's what we have to do. Now, there are a lot of uncertainties that are related to this, but the deeper concern is the, you know, the brashness of the U.S. Uh, government, uh, led by President Donald Trump. Uh, what was an attempt to kind of settle concerns that the U.S. was escalating the language with uh, North Korea, what is generally considered to be a very unstable uh, country, uh, with the, poten the potential of uh, nuclear capacity uh, was backed off a little bit uh, by the Secretary of State. Um, but proving just uh, how bombastic he is, uh, Donald Trump on vacation actually suggested that uh, he meant what he said, uh, the fire and fury commentary, and suggested that it might have been not strong enough. So 
really amplifying the threat of war, but in turn that also suggests that uh, the political stability with the United States could be at risk as uh, Congress uh, starts to really question uh, the support for this kind of uh, aggressive uh, posturing. So we have the threat of a uh, of an international incident and war, uh, which the United States uh, has been very uh, war fatigued over the past few decades, uh, as well as again the return to uh, political stability questions. Now remember, we're still in what's con deemed or considered the Trump rally. Uh, the Trump rally actually began back in November after the election. We'll turn over. That was the E minis. This is the Spider ETF. Um, the Trump rally began after the elections because the expectations were not this is a great candidate versus the other one, but rather because the economic programs that were promised by the candidate on the campaign trail, the tax reforms, the infrastructure spending, and yes, also the, the regulatory rollback were seen as economic and business positive. But those programs have not been implemented. Uh, in fact, they haven't even really seen significant traction or the structure or the bones of a reasonable uh, starting point. So the confidence that this economic projection, especially in contrast to the uncertainties of trade in the position the United States uh, has in the global trade uh, uh, matrix, was already dropping off. And now we have another catalyst, more catalysts that come along to suggest that that agenda, that growth forecast, is not only unlikely, now it's getting buried by other issues. So this is one of those building considerations, and it's starting to shake loose some of the complacency. Uh, the reality that uh, the infrastructure spending program in particular was being pushed back further and further and further and looking increasingly unlikely was ignored because, hey, speculative momentum was still in place. But now we're starting to see some technical pressure of very serious making. Uh, getting back below 2450 is a critical break. You're talking about uh, clearing the 50-day uh, moving average. You're talking about clearing trend line support. And you're starting to get you're starting to get the kind of impact that is influencing the types of traders that we have in now. This is not really a deep buy and hold kind of market. The people that have invested over the past three to six months have not been heavily the discount buyers, the value buyers, because there isn't a lot of value to reap. If anything, and this is why I keep going back to this, uh, this chart, we have to remember that the baseline for for return for for value investors uh, they're not just looking at capital gains although that is something that they do uh, can factor into their trading or their investments uh, the purchase of something that is of uh, lower value price wise and is expected to appreciate they also look for yield dividends uh, earnings carry all right they look for these consistent rates of return and it is complemented by capital gains. But these have been extraordinarily small, a side effect of very accommodative monetary policy. And against the low volatility, that is somewhat uh, uh, tolerated. But then you have something like the combination of these two, and you look at the value versus the price, and it really is skewed. And we remind, we remind ourselves that these are not investors that have been very active recently. They've been speculators, people taking advantage of short-term momentum. And when that momentum breaks, and we really expose the fact that volume uh, has been extraordinarily low, in fact, it is continuously uh, declining to the point where July was the lowest level of volume, I'm using the Spider ETF again, since February of 2002, or sorry, 2005. We recognize that volume has been that low, and that was through July. We know that there is a thin market. Thin markets amplify volatility. When you have a market that is made up of primarily speculators, rather than investors who are willing to support a drawdown, they have a longer duration and uh, uh, market exposure. Uh, instead, we get the very antsy, very reactive uh, market participants. It really puts us in, in jeopardy of risk aversion. It's those conditions that matter most. So the North Korea escalation, as it continues, is a catalyst here. But 
if we're going to actually find this market rollover, it's not going to be a persistent escalation of remarks, although that certainly would help it uh, along uh, into panic. It would rather be a recognition from the markets that their exposure is just too unsteady and that the weak-handed uh, trade uh, uh, leverage that we've been seeing is going to be shaken loose and subsequently uh, we'll start seeing pullback of those uh, traders that really aren't willing to s sit through a drawdown and you're going to get to a point where eventually it's going to hit the, the the investors investors who have gotten in earlier in the bull trend that start to see the the, the threat of holding out the drawdowns getting into or eating away their profits uh, and subsequently uh, maybe even getting into losses depending on when they, they entered and how deep this correction becomes. So we're really on the cusp of risk aversion. And this is certainly very true of U.S. equities. I think are the benchmark. Uh, here's the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the uh, NASDAQ. Right? These are the major equity indexes, but it's not just isolated here. We're actually seeing the the spread of concern and uncertainty around the world. I think we're actually, maybe I would, up, uh, I should upgrade this a couple of steps, but we're starting to see certainly a move into the severity of risk aversion. You certainly have very high level correlation, but what would really escalate into a self-sustaining cycle. So when you get into risk aversion to the point where you're talking about deleveraging and liquidity crunches, you're talking about a self-sustaining cycle. Anything really here and above is self-sustaining, and that you want to avoid if you're a bull or a long-term investor in a long-only capacity. But what can move us up there is the not just the correlation, but the intensity. But taking a look at the correlation first, uh, you have other equity indexes around the world. The DAX, the German equity index, has been carving out this head and shoulders pattern, which we've been following for a while. This actually, I mean, if you're a pure technician, you could say that that actually cleared the neckline on the head and shoulders pattern. Further, it also uh, takes out this trend line, although uh, I don't really, I think this is generally one point, two point, and I'm a three point kind of a, a trend line person. So it doesn't really fit the crucial break because uh, it didn't really hit the high profile uh, verification that I look for in these kind of patterns. But nevertheless, that is a multi-month low and it does look like a technical reversal. The FTSE 100 had a massive decline, not a full scale reversal. The Nikkei 25 had a break earlier this week, though Japanese markets are offline uh, for Friday. So we're not going to see how they are contributing to the circulation of risk aversion through the 24 hour cycle. Looking beyond equities though, uh, we get into the emerging markets, clear aggressive break there. High yield fixed income, which was already dropping, has extended its decline and certainly taking out, taken out some support there. Uh, this does look like general risk aversion. All right, correlation is definitely there. The progress that we were seeing speaks to escalation, uh, but perhaps not that far that we're getting into a guaranteed self-sustaining cycle. So in the context, I'm not ready to just back up the truck and uh, buy out uh, all the short side on the S&P 500 or uh, just uh, scale up on uh, massive amounts of puts, but we are getting to that point. Looking for particularly uh, acute or appealing risk-oriented assets to take advantage of. Uh, the S&P 500 is arguably one of the best. I mean, it's, uh, it is extraordinarily expensive and relative to most other assets uh, in terms of sheer performance, uh, it is one of the most extended over the long period of time, uh, starting from the great financial crisis. So it has the most room to lose. Uh, but it is also the most stubborn, so don't be too cavalier with what your expectations are. Uh, in other risk uh, benchmarks, uh, the volatility was just the lowest boundary. Uh, that extreme positioning, the extreme lows, it really... Uh, I'm not one of the uh, those type that readily uh, go against the sell volatility crowd. It comes from my 
background on options, but that is such an imbalance that it, it, it really was a great trade for those that were long uh, volatility, which could be, you know, long puts on the S&P 500 futures, or uh, it could be just outright exposure to volatility indices. Uh, the VXX traders, I'm sure, are very vindicated, but not the best instrument to actually express this view through. It is a fundamentally flawed uh, asset. But we are at the cusp of seeing that, that escalation. We, we could uh, tip into full-scale risk aversion, or we might just pull back into complacency. But I do think that given the intensity of this move, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to just simply uh, revert back to the quiet August that we had cut uh, through the previous uh, week. Right. You're, you're not going to get that really low volatility uh, reversion that you had before. This kind of shock is going to sit with the market, and it's going to put the speculative crowd on uh, on edge. So we're going to get more uh, s uh, swells like this, but we're also going to get a, a consistent rise in the resting rate of volatility, which means more activity in the broader markets, not just equities, but in the broader financial system. And that means more trade opportunity. We need to look at it in those terms as well. Be mindful of your trades, obviously. You don't want to get uh, caught in anything like buying a dip, uh, which is a very popular phrase nowadays. Um, buying a dip and not really appreciating the full-scale risk of the imbalance there. Uh, but certainly there are opportunities that we can face. Now, in the FX world, all right, the risk aversion is uh, something we talked about uh, before. I, I discussed it multiple times, but I've only really discussed it in the most quiet of conditions. Uh, now that we're in the midst of uh, a sudden surge of volatility, emotions run high and we start to uh, revert back to our, our animal natures in, in choosing our safety. Uh, but remember the arguments to be made on safe haven uh, considerations. One, people have to take off a, uh, their extended exposure. So those things that they had invested in as risky assets or high return assets are probably going to be cut and cut aggressively if risk conversion does kick in. But if we get to a greater intensity, the absolute haven or flight uh, to safety can be overwhelming. Now, I, I mentioned these two considerations because really that is the dichotomy of the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar was invested uh, or was an appealing asset to invest in uh, in U.S. Ass uh, assets in general because it had a higher degree of yield. And furthermore, the Fed was hiking rates. So people actually went long dollar in the assumption that they were going to ride the wave out of higher carry, getting in ahead of slow money because the yield that the, the dollar actually offers is not that great. So the, the low yield carry trade that has been really overdone, much like the S&P 500 is overdone, uh, is really the foundation of the dollar. So as people take off carry, they're taking off long dollar and short some of these other currencies used to fund that carry trade. But I think that's already been a, a, a theme of 2017. We've already seen a pullback in this carry trade, not because of risk aversion, obviously, and risk aversion wasn't happening during that time frame, but rather because the carry appeal of the currency itself was diminished because its counterparts were starting to rise. People recognized that it was a really uh, sparse yield, so they started to back off. This can shake off a considerable amount of carry. The question becomes, is there more carry that needs to be taken off on a long dollar position? And if so, will we escalate to full scale panic? Because in those terms, the dollar is going to rally. The financiers of the world, the, the commanders of large amounts of capital uh, have been taught and through history uh, go back to U.S. Treasuries and U.S. money markets in the height of panic. Uh, just look back at the great financial crisis and how the dollar performed in the midst of the 2008 collapse. That was a flight to haven, uh, and that was a flight to dollar, even though it seemed like the subprime crisis uh, in the United States was the center of that motivation. So you have to think in these terms. This is a very complicated currency when it comes to this transitional risk view. 
and hence why I don't think that the dollar has committed one way or the other. The fact that we are not seeing carry on one via the dollar suggests to me that we've really deflated a lot of that uh, that high level speculative uh, exposure that it had. In contrast, the likes of the Aussie, for example, that has been late to the game buildup of carry. The expectations that the RBA was going to follow the Bank of Canada's footsteps, and we started pricing in early rate hikes for the RBA, even though they suggest it's not anywhere near uh, near term. I think the Aussie dollar has a lot more to lose. If we clear 78.50 and risk aversion continues, and even if it doesn't continue, if it just levels out, it could still put pressure on the Aussie dollar and in its extended positions. Aussie USD, Aussie yen in particular, uh, are extended on that view. The same is true of the Kiwi USD. And the Kiwi Yen, just this past uh, Wednesday, we had the RBNZ rate decision, which they uh, shelved all expectations of a near-term rate hike, and that pulls back on that carry potential as well. They're the, R, they're the Aussie dollar, but three weeks forward. All right, so these, this is a carry that could potentially play out. Generally, the Yen crosses, broadly speaking, are exposed... Uh, risk aversion opportunities, if they take. Uh, I was talking about uh, different yen crosses yesterday that are appealing. Should risk appetite bounce? Should risk appetite just start to break lower? Or if risk appetite really starts to add to its momentum? Uh, adding to its momentum is Aussie yen, Kiwi yen, and CAD yen. The rebound uh, yen cross was pound yen, as it was coinciding with technical support on a rising triangle or wedge at 142. Obviously, that's cleared. I would not be too enthusiastic about trying to buy up on, on this at these levels. This really depends not on the technicals. The technicals are being overridden by the fundamentals. So you have to take the, the, the mood of the market, and that can be difficult to do. The euro yen was the... If uh, the condition, if, if we do see an escalation of risk aversion, it has not fully collapsed. The euro is sitting on a ton of, of premium, uh, of unrealized speculation that they are going to, in the sometime foreseeable future, back out of QE, treating it not as a backing out of QE, but rather as a really early carry trade opportunity. That is just going way out on a fundamental limb and expecting it to just uh, hold up our weight. This has a lot to lose in risk aversion. So I, this is where most of my interest is. And uh, I'll see if it has any bounce around here. But uh, this is where I would want to go short in, in a uh, clear risk aversion uh, mentality. Even if risk aversion t doesn't take, just like Aussie dollar, if even if it just stabilizes, the uncertainty that this adds and distraction it takes away from monetary policy forecasting six, nine months down the road is too intense. So it's going to be more of a pressure to push this lower, really regardless of the outcome, short of a massive risk on element. So I'm keeping very close uh, focus here. All right. Now, there are other risk-oriented currency crosses for the same uh, argument we can make for the euro USD. Obviously, it's not willing to commit. Uh, we don't know where the dollar is in terms of deleveraging its carry appeal. Uh, the euro is certainly very uh, high on the speculative hog at the moment, so we'll see what it has to offer. Um, pairs like the pound dollar, though, uh, and uh, the dollar CAD to a certain degree, although this will continue to rise if risk conversion kicks in, are less uh, intense and less def definitive in their fundamental standing, so they're not uh, at the high end of my uh, focus. But there are certain trades that you can bid the dip on a pullback in risk, or you can really commit to risk aversion. Uh, but I think it's also worthwhile to look for trades that aren't really risk associated uh, at all. And those are few and far between, but they do exist. One of them is the Kiwi CAD, which I've talked about in the past. This is the uh, this is two currencies that are considered uh, risk-oriented currencies, commodity currencies, export-dependent currencies. Um, this really is a focus on something uh, aside from just the pure risk-on-risk-off influence. And the Canadian dollar has really been picking up because of its its expectations that Bank of Canada is going to be able to pursue its rate-tightening policies. But in the midst of risk aversion, uh, both RBNZ and Bank of Canada are going to uh, throttle back on any kind of rate 
forecasts. They're going to be very uh, reticent, as is the likes of the Fed and the ECB for pulling out a QE. But this really helps to reduce that uh, fundamental influence. So I'm going to be watching the Kiwi CAD very close because as a range uh, boundary, if it holds and starts to bounce, this is a it's going to be far less dramatic, but it's going to be far more reasonable and probable in the context of what we actually have to offer on these markets. All right, so look for the range. Look for sentiment-sensitive uh, trades. Look for uh, those that can get away from them because there's a lot of speculative capital that needs to be placed on the line to make that kind of call. So you want to diversify your views. All right, so ahead, the number one concern that we need to maintain is how is risk evolving? Are we finally going to get uh, this the spark to catch and turn into a wildfire, or is it uh, another uh, fizzle out and return to norm? We'll never really recover to the full scale of norm and and low li low volatility and uh, peacefulness, tranquility in the markets that we had before, uh, but we can delay uh, further uh, the inevitable rebalance. So where are we at in this development? That's what should be on the top of our minds going into this final 24-hour session and even into next week. We'll update on it tomorrow, and we'll see the, the scope of conviction tomorrow. Until then, I will uh, wish you good luck trading out there.